Well, I'm a pianist and composer uh, and French horn player as well and uh, I think my music has a cross between uh, the jazz world and the classical world. I started off as a, a classical, uh, classically trained pianist and composer and then I got into jazz music and I enjoyed the freedom that you get with jazz of improvisation and uh, working in a group with other musicians and, and the kind of different areas of music that you can get into when you approach uh, jazz. I mean, jazz as a word, you know, covers such a huge, wide, disparate field of music that it's quite exciting to be part of that and to, to go with all the different influences that, that you come across when you're, you're studying and when you're playing as a, as a professional musician. So um, tonight I'm playing a solo concert here and um, the music again has a, you know, some influences from the jazz side, some from the folk side, some from the classical side. And um, and hopefully it's not always obvious when the music's improvised or when it's composed because I think the important thing at the end of the day is that, that each piece sort of has a story and hopefully it has a narrative and a kind of arc to, to the shape of the music. So sometimes that encompasses maybe like 90% improvisation and other times it might be 50-50 with yeah. the written and other times it might be a bit more of a, a sort of through composed piece. So there's a kind of combination of different things. It's interesting, that, it's, it's an interesting question. I think mentally it's quite a challenge because, you know, when you're playing in a group, you're kind of there with your, your mates and you're, you're kind of having a nice time together and you're having a conversation through music. And I think at its best, jazz is about uh, a conversation and it's about um, the music as a language and, you know, as I say, it's just like you're meeting up with your your pals and having a, a chat about a subject. So it's conversations with yourself today? Yeah, I think, yeah that's, that, that's a difficult thing when you're on your own, you, you've not got that, you've not got that kind of support and you're, you're very reliant on yourself for, for improvisatory ideas and for the shape and the dynamic and the, the kind of energy of the performance, it's all down to you. So I think over the, the last four or five years that I've been playing solo, that's been one of the biggest challenges is to, to kind of work out a way of dealing with that almost isolation in a way. Um, you know, when you're travelling around, like today I travel to the concert in a car on my own, or if I go and play abroad, and you get on a plane and you travel to different places and you're doing all this on, on your own. And as I say, one of the things that attracted me to jazz in the first place is that it's a very communal music. So actually working your own, getting your head around the fact that you're just doing this kind of solitary type um, thing of coming out to perform is, um, is a different challenge. I think one of the things that I, I realised pretty quickly is that the, the, kind of, the way that you communicate with the audience is, is very crucial when you're, you're playing solo, so the music that I play I like to talk about each piece a lot and there is a story behind most of the pieces that I play and I think that really helps to, to hopefully get the listener in and, and on board and, and included in what, what you're trying to do. Um, if you're a singer, then of course it's easy for a, an audience member, to, a listener, to to understand the story of the music. But when you've not got that, when you've just got an instrument, then I think for some, sometimes it can be a bit kind of daunting as a listener to jazz music because you get all these notes, and and it might be easy to think, you know, why why is that person doing that? Why is he playing those notes? So so just have a little idea about the story behind the music, I think helps to to, to feel to, to feel included when you're listening. Okay. Do you have, feel like you've got more freedom solo? Um, yeah, to, to a certain respect, yeah. I mean, of course, you can just do, do whatever you, you want and you're not going to be holding to, to playing as part of a structure that you've rehearsed with other, other musicians. But, uh, again, one, one of the nice things about playing jazz with a band is that you're working off other people's ideas, and I think that's one of the beautiful things about mm. playing jazz in a group is that, you know, you know your own ideas to a certain extent because that's what you practice and that's what what you know that you're you're capable of doing. So when you're playing with some other musicians, if you know them very well or whether you've never met them before, you get to work off the things that they come up with. So it's like your your vocabulary is completely expanded by that. So playing on your own, you're trying to kind of really try and create new things that, that's going to surprise yourself which is always a always a challenge but I think it's a nice thing to to try and at least aspire to. I hate the idea of going out to do a concert and knowing exactly what's going to happen because I think that would defeat the purpose of, of improvisation so yeah. I think when I practice for me practice is about um, having the kind of freedom and 
feeling comfortable enough with your technique that so when you, you do think of something in the moment of a performance you feel like you can just let it out without being inhibited by thinking all oh, right I need to play my third finger on that or turn my thumb over here because those technical things you don't really want to be worrying about when you're, when you're playing the performance. Yeah. Well, I went to a music school up in Manchester called Cheatham School of Music and I was there from the age of 9 to 18 and I think it was probably when I was about 13 or 14 um, some of the, the, the people at the school said, oh why don't you try some improvisation classes for classical musicians and a big band there as well, so I, I kind of got into, into those and I was instantly kind of hooked really. I, uh, the guy who was taking the classes is called Steve Berry. He was a wonderful bass player, member of Loose Tubes, the great um, the big band from, from the 80s, fantastic British big band. And he's a really wonderful educator, a really enthusiastic and passionate educator about jazz and about improvisation. And he made me a cassette up of lots of different uh, jazz musicians and, uh, and I just used to play this cassette over and over again because I just thought oh, I'd never heard anything like it before, I'd only really heard you know, a lot of classical music but not really too many other types of music so just hearing this freedom and, uh, and beauty and expression you know, within groups of musicians and, and all this very interesting harmony and, and rhythm and, and some of the things which are not quite so obvious on the, on the classical side. Yeah. I thought, oh wow, this, yeah, this is, I could really get into this and really enjoy it and that's where it started I think, for me. Well, well, on this on this cassette, um, the first track was a Keith Jarrett track called Questar off a great album called My Song from I think the late seventies, and then there were two Pat Metheny tracks off an album called Travels, and then an Egberto Gismonti track, uh, and then loads of other things. But I just remember those first four tracks, and you, as I say, you should just play them till I wore the tape out. And there was just a lot of beauty in that music. So there were a lot of similarities with classical music. It had all the kind yeah. of the beautiful harmony and the, the kind of passion and the emotion of it, but with this freedom of, of improvisation. So I think Steve Berry was very, he, he chose some really good tracks and, and I'm very, very grateful for that because maybe if he'd have chosen things which were a little bit more further removed from the classical world, I might not have been able to make that leap quite so yeah. easily, but because the tracks that he chose had a lot of common ground with classical music, all, all of a sudden I, I could see how possibly I could get to the point of getting into this music from where I was at that, that time. I think when I, when I left classical music school I went down to the Royal Academy of Music in London I did a jazz degree there and I think at that point I was ready to just really immerse myself in jazz so I, I sort of went away a bit from classical music at that point but I think I realised after about four or five years that, that actually you know I had such a strong upbringing in, in the classical world, it seems a shame to discard that. And actually whilst I was still at college, um, probably my third year at college, so it would be about 2002, I got introduced to Malcolm Creasy who runs a group called Acoustic Triangle mm -hmm. and um, I went on to play in that band for, for a long time and that that's a, a band which is really dedicated to, to the crossover between classical and jazz music, so that helped me to get back towards a, a basis of of, of something a little bit closer to classical music. I, I wouldn't really say that I'd ever go out and perform any classical pieces because I don't really feel like that's what, what I, I want to do and actually my experiences of going to a classical music school led me to, to that conclusion that it wasn't really yeah. for me to go out and play Rachmaninoff and Mozart and, and I, I have utmost respect for the, for the pianists who can go out and do that because again they have that insular thing in the, of, of just going out and playing 150, 200 concerts a year on their own of the same music and I, I don't think I've, I've got the mental discipline to be able to, to do that and I, I didn't like the idea of, of being in a practice room on your own for six or seven hours a day and just doing that, that one thing. Um, so the, the classical in influence comes a lot into my music in the way that I write and the way, hopefully the way that I play but, um, but yeah as I say I probably wouldn't go out and, and, and perform a classical piece. Um, well, I've had a lot of really great teachers and actually one of the people I work with a lot, uh, John Taylor, who's a legendary English piano player who I had a lesson with when I was at college and then subsequently I've done quite a few duo concerts with him which has been fantastic because he was always one of my absolute heroes so to get to work with your, your heroes is a fantastic thing and, and quite unusual I guess with him being a piano player as well. And, and although I had, I had this great long lesson with him when I was at college I think the fact that we've done 
maybe nearly ten concerts together now um, playing piano duo. Uh, I mean, everyone's just a lesson really because you you just at such close quarters with you know such a great pianist who's got so much per persona and, and character in the way that he plays the piano. So just to be opposite someone doing that is the best lesson of all, really. So it's been a a very enjoyable experience getting to know him through through making music together. Well, I mean the word jazz, as I, I mentioned before, I mean jazz is a it's a difficult word, word in a way, uh, as I suppose classical can be, and, and all these words they encompass such a wide breadth uh, of music, and I know we need we need those kind of words because people like to put things in, in yeah. pigeonholes. But for How me, would you yeah, explain it to the uh, uninitiated? Yeah, the uninitiated. Well, I think the the, the key component of, of jazz music is is improvisation. I think that's the one constant that pretty much, you know, if you went to any type of jazz concert, you could be guaranteed there's going to be improvisation. But I guess outside of that, it can be difficult to, to say what you're going to see. I mean, if you think what you could have under the umbrella of the word jazz, you've got trad jazz and free jazz, modern jazz, Bebop, post bop, Latin jazz, jazz rock, uh, you know, all those different styles of music, they're, in a way, they're, they're so different sounding. If you just put a little five second snippet of each of those different styles, it'd be crazy to say that they were all part of the same. As I mentioned before, jazz, that one word encompasses such a wide breadth of, of different types of music, and I guess the one constant that you have to all these different types of, of jazz is that you have improvisation in there. And it can be difficult as a performer struggling with that word jazz because I think a lot of people maybe get scared just by the word really because they might have heard a type of jazz that that maybe they're not so familiar with or they don't really like and it would be difficult for anyone to, to like every single type of jazz because you if you go right back to kind of Dixie, trad jazz, then you've got modern jazz, bebop, post-bop, free jazz, latin jazz, jazz rock, all these different things are very different from each other if you just took a little snapshot of the sound of it but they all come under this one umbrella. So I, I think one of the the important things as a performer is to try and make your music as accessible to an audience as possible. And that doesn't mean selling out or changing the way that you play, but it does mean trying to to make the music um, tell a story and, and communicate. I think that's probably the key word. Make make what you do communicate with a, with an audience. Yeah. Um, and as I say, for me that that communication, I think it's important to, to talk about your music and explain. Where it's coming from, and some of the maybe some of the musical devices, as well as some of the emotional reasons and some of the stories behind why you make this music. And unfortunately, I mean, it, you know, so many people come out of college training of jazz music and, and that kind of thing these days, and I, I was a result of that. But people don't always tell you about these things. They just tell you how to to play your instruments and how to get really good at at that, which of course is a, a huge part of being a musician, but actually when you become a professional you realise that there's so much more to it than that, actually marketing yourself and having a career is very very different from actually being a, a proficient musician, and I think that, that maybe jazz musicians aren't always great at, at recognising that and finding a way of getting their music out there as to, to as wide an audience as they possibly could do. Being able to afford to eat every day is probably a good one. Um, I think my well, I think my proudest moment was doing doing one of the proms, the prom concerts. I think it was in 2008, and I wrote a piano concerto for for piano and orchestra, well, piano trio and orchestra, which were were sort of live on the telly and in the proms. So that 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 was certainly the most important thing I've, I've done. I had one of my albums nominated for the Mercury Awards as well a couple of years ago. So it's nice to to have your your work recognised, and of course, I'm realistic enough to, to know that you know if you win any awards or anything like that, or you don't, it doesn't really make any difference to how good good your music is. But yeah. but it is a challenge to to find your own way and build build a career. So any kind of exposure like that is really invaluable to to someone playing the kind of music that I do because I'm you know realistically the, the type of music that I love. It's not it's not really popular music, and even within the sphere of jazz, I think the combination of classical and jazz is probably one of the the less popular of of the kind of hybrids of different types of music. So, um, getting that story out there of what you do is a, is a constant challenge.
I suppose because I went to this music school when I was nine, which is obviously quite an early age, I was very used to, to performing a lot from a, maybe an early age than, than, than many people would be. So by the age of sort of coming, coming to London in my late teens, early twenties, I was already very used to being a, a performer, which I guess helps, I think that certainly helps to have gone into it at, a, at an early age. Um, I, I think I, I can't remember what year it was, I made my first album, that was 2007, so I would have been uh, about 26, which, I mean, the difficult thing about making an album is that, well, not the difficult thing, but the thing which can be daunting is that music's going to be there forever. The, the, the music that you recorded on a particular day, you know, in a particular mood, or you got cold, or you're tired, or whatever, that, that's documented there for the, for the end of time, and that can be quite a scary concept. But I think as I've got a bit older, I'm able to, to sort of decide that, or, or to kind of be comfortable with the fact that, that an album is kind of a snapshot, just like a, a picture is in a way, of, of a particular time in a particular place and, and what you were doing at that time. And I, I find it a bit difficult to listen back to some of the things that I've done sometimes, because you, you can just hear the kind of faults in it and the things that frustrated you when you were doing it. And it's very difficult to hear the, any, any beauty in what, what you do yourself. So, um, so I've always found that a bit stressful listening back to, to records that I've been involved with. But, um, but certainly in terms of, uh, of being a leader, I've had a lot of experience that now. And I, I really enjoy it. It's great. I guess I'm probably quite a bossy person, so it's quite nice to, to be in charge of stuff. And certainly playing a lot of solo concerts is great because you, you don't have to, to worry about anything about, apart from sorting yourself out. I don't, don't think it was intimidating. I, I think that one of the beautiful things about this kind of music that we do with jazz is that it's such a small world, you know, it really does feel like it's a, a community and a family because, you know, there are so few of us, you know, in the grand scheme of things doing it that I think everyone understands that and, and you do feel an affinity with those people around you. And, and one of the other things that I, I learned very quickly is that the, the best people in, in this kind of life and in this business are tend to be the nicest as well. So people like Stan Saltz and Martin France, who are absolute legends and to me, absolute heroes before I got to meet them, are, you know, they're just these really easy going, wonderful people to work with and, and no, not for a second ever make you feel like they they're better than you or they're they're the big i am and you're just like the new guy growing up and i think the beautiful thing about this music that it, it transcends all these different boundaries that you can have in some other fields of life and certainly age and, and that kind of thing it doesn't make any difference and i've been fortunate to play with people like steve swallow who's an absolute legend who's now in his 70s and also i've played with with people who are younger than me and it, it's nice getting your bum kicked by by them as well you, you know you check out the the younger people and what they're listening to and and it's really exciting because it sends you off into a different direction and people like the young drummer James Maginu who I've been lucky enough to work with and become really good mates with over the last few years and he'll be ch showing me things that he's been listening to which I would have never thought of uh, of checking out so it's one it's just one big sort of family in a way and uh, I, I don't think there's ever an issue of people feeling, feeling like they're, they're better or worse than, than anybody else Well, that's how it worked with, with me, with James, actually. I was doing a project in, in the Royal Academy of Music and play, they were playing my music and James was playing drums and it just sounded fantastic what he was doing. So I thought it would be nice to have a, to do a project with him and, and that's how we got to know each other. So I think though colleges are very interesting in that way because obviously you, it's quite strange to have this environment where your, your improvisations are marked and they're judged because it should just be an expression of what you do. But actually in terms of the community of music it's quite an interesting place to be around lots of other musicians and they're not just the other students but also the people who are teaching and, uh, and as I say I've been on both ends of that, that kind of thing with very happy results for me so I'm very grateful to have, have been a part of that. Well yeah I mean last year I had quite a busy year because I was involved with three different albums and the, the first one of those three came out at the end of last year with a band called Impossible Gentleman um, with Mike Walker, the great guitarist from Manchester. And uh, the other two albums that I was working on, the first one it came out this, this week actually, where it was a duo album with Yuri Golubev, who's a fantastic uh, bassist who also, like myself, has a classical and jazz sort of hybrid training. And we made an album at this wonderful place called Schloss Alma, which is in the Bavarian mountains. Um, beautiful concert hall out there. Um, uh, that album, as I say, has just come out. and. 
I'll play a couple of tunes from that tonight. Um, and the, the last album of the three features the City of London Symphonia, so it's kind of a chamber orchestra album with jazz trio. And um, I finished that about, about August, September last year, and that's not actually going to come out till April this year, but um, those, those three things sort of took up a lot of my time last year so it's quite nice to have them all finished and you know it's something you, you do feel proud when you when you've put all this effort in something then you see it kind of existing as a, as a real actual unit and you can sort of say oh I did that which is kind of kind of nice so on the on the concert tonight I'll try and play a little bit of music from from all those things actually my name is Gwilym Suncock and you're watching Leicester Jazz House TV <laughs> 